on today's world in time. Space, the final frontier. As China gears up to explore the moon, the planets, and beyond, the nation carries out its mission with aerospace innovation and cutting edge technology. How far has China gone in reaching for the stars? And currently we have uh, decided to have more than nine uh, uh, payloads to be flying on, on board the Chinese station and the second batch is to be opened. Hello and welcome to World Insight with Wu Qingwei. The 20th National Congress of the Communist Party of China gives high priority to self-reliance in science and technology. Through devoting resources to an innovation-led development strategy, China has become a nation of innovators with major advances made in the space program. In the past decade, China achieved notable space exploration milestones, including the Chang'e lunar probe bringing lunar samples back to Earth, the Tianwen-1 landing and exploring Mars, deploying the Beidou navigation satellite system, the launchings of the Shenzhou-14 manned space mission, the Tiangong-2 space lab, and the dark matter probe satellite Wukong. Will successful space exploration catalyze future tech advances in China? And how is China contributing to the overall innovation-driven growth of our world today? For deeper insights, let's have our panelists. For more on China's aerospace development in western the United States, Keith Cowen, a former NASA rocket scientist and the editor of nasawatch.com. In Beijing, Xu Yansong, director general of the Asia-Pacific Space Cooperation Organization. Welcome to both of you, gentlemen. Long time no see, but certainly a lot of great news in terms of uh, uh, space uh, development uh, for all. But let's start with China. Uh, Mr. Xu, with the CPC Party Congress uh, convening right now, a lot of achievements have been mentioned in the opening ceremony report. Exactly. We have heard that the uh, Mars mission uh, from China and also the lunar mission, as well as, as the Tengong construction has been mentioned. Uh, we know that the Mars mission uh, went uh, uh, TM1 has been winning the international prize in the International Astronautic Congress. And also that is one of the greatest engineering achievements uh, with one lander and orbiter and the rover at the same time uh, launching in one con configuration. And also uh, images are transmitting coming back from Mars surface to the orbiter and then related to, uh, to Earth. And also we're seeing the Mars uh, uh, images for the first time from China. Yeah. And also the lunar mission has also been achieved by sample returning missions. And uh, now we have one point, more than 1.7 uh, uh, kilograms of uh, 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 moon matters. And also we're studying those. And also the con construction of Tiangong is near its completion. Uh, mm -hmm. The core module and also one of the modules has been launched and three astronauts are being are working in this station <laughs> and we're expecting an overlapping with another three. Certainly, um, we see a lot of uh, pleasant uh, response about international space uh, development from all corners of the world. Of course, there's some kinds of competition, but uh, Keith, looking at the list, uh, Mr. Xu, just give uh, uh, your response about uh, where China is in the overall contribution of space development. Well, I've always felt that the more space stations, the better, the more people in space, better. <laughs> and for every nation, there's 10 reasons to go into space. And you now see, uh, from a Western perspective, um, people say, well, you know, China's do or India or Japan are doing things we did 50 years ago. And my response is, why are they excited about it? And why are we saying, oh, ho, ho? What, are, what is the rest of, of the world picking up on that's interesting? So I think uh, for us here in the West, China's accomplishments and those of India and other countries serve as a prompt for us to, you know, get back in the saddle and get back to exploring space. Uh, what about the space station, uh, Tiangong, uh, Mr. Xu, uh, that is now, as you said, on the way. Uh, where are we now and how much can we expect from international cooperation? I think there are uh, three uh, elements, the station construction itself, the astronauts and the application of the station. 
the construction of the station is, is to be completed by end of this year, by the final launching of uh, Meng Tian segment. So that would be a, a configuring a T-shaped uh, station uh, uh, with a total of 92 metric tons. And also there is another one, uh, which is a, a space telescope that is going to be um, uh, in this uh, size uh, station orbit that's going to be orbiting uh, around the station. That was originally designed as part of the station, but it was uh, separated so that it has a, a good observation and also convenient maintenance from the astronauts. The second segment is the astronauts themselves. We have um, the European astronauts being trained in China, also Chinese astronauts extended, exchanged their uh, trainings in Europe. So they have also uh, started learning Chinese. The astronauts are going to be uh, part of the station in the future. The construction phase will be completed by the Chinese astronauts. Mm -hmm. And the application of this station is also very important. Once it's completed, it will have some, uh, some usage as the international station is having uh, more than uh, thousands of payloads. Uh, so we're, we're also calling international cooperation on the payloads, uh, uh, on the applications. Uh, from the UN USA, uh, Office for Outer Space Affairs of the United Nations. So mm -hmm. they are uh, also calling uh, announcement of opportunities for international communities. And currently we have uh, decided to have more than nine uh, uh, payloads to be flying on, on board the Chinese station and the second batch is to be opened. How do you see, uh, Mr. Cowen, that these kinds of development uh, can contribute to the limited uh, uh, resources that we all together in the world has been devoting to outer space development? Well, there's a, a, a magnifying factor that if you have only one space station and you're pretty much limited to what that can or can't do, when you start putting more than one up there, suddenly it's not just to, you have two, but as we were discussing before that you, the show began, there's a synergy between having two different ways to do things. And as I mentioned, I was on CGTN last year when uh, one of the crews came up to Chen Gong and was going inside. And I was looking at the really close at the, you know, doing commentary, waiting for them to open the hatch. And I said, this looks familiar. I've seen that before. Oh, wait, that's new. There's a commonality between these space stations that, as we would say here, there's an emergent property that sort of pops up that's greater than just the two separate. Politics sometimes jumps in the middle, and the science always finds a way around that. But when you have two space stations, you have more than just two, I guess mm. is what I would say. Uh, one plus one should be bigger than two. That, I love that logic. But when you talk about the synergy, what exactly are you referring to? Well, there's a European uh, astronaut going up uh, yes. to the Chinese station. All right. I would bet you that that astronaut or a friend of his was on the International Space Station. If you look at very closely at the way that things plug into the space station, uh, the U.S., Russian, European, Japanese space station, and then you look at what you've got in the Chinese modules now, some of them are identical. So you can now have somebody who works something maybe on the International Space Station, comes back, puts an improved version on the China station or vice versa. Mm. So again, it may be that some politics may say you can't go directly, but again, science and always finds a way to get around that. So that's mm. the emergent property that I'm talking about here is that it breeds. And then somebody says, well, maybe we should need another station that could do something else. That's what I'm looking forward to when you have not one or two, but five or 10 space stations. How do you see China is looking at the earlier version of space station, just to use this as an example, and how is China working on the current version? Uh, how much inspirations uh, do you see international cooperation uh, could bring to the future development of this space station? And even what Keith just mentioned, the synergy between the two space stations, one plus one should be bigger than two. That should be the logic at least. Well, I think the Chinese station is much more smaller than the international space. But we built at a later time, so we have more, uh, like us say, mature technologies and also things and lessons we have learned from the previous uh, stations. We know the very first one was the uh, Russian Mir station. And then from there, we evolved into the international space station, including uh, the, you know, more than 20 countries participating in part of the construction. As uh, Kit had mentioned, that there uh, there are European uh, segments and Japanese segments and Russian segments and also U.S. segments, um, but the Chinese station is able to build by its own. Um, so we can have a let's say a ground integration process 
rather than the International Space Station, you build your own segments and then you integrate them once and for all in space, not tested in, in the ground. So we have certain advantages. And also we, have, we, we see some, uh, some of the exchanges and overlappings and standardizing of some of the components and facilities that can be also uh, good for future uh, applications. So mm -hmm. I, I think um, more than one station is very useful. And also lessons can also be learned for international cooperation and also autonomous and, and independent development programs. Mm -hmm. As far as I understand, Mr. Xu, the uh, China space station also is on its way to invite uh, more uh, researchers and astronauts coming from developing countries. Now, that's going to be a very uh, unique phenomenon because uh, as far as we know, the Global South is not necessarily uh, on its way yet uh, to be at the top of the level in terms of space technologies. So what does that mean for the Global South could be if we could use that word Global South? Well, I think um, uh, we, all, we have always attached importance to developing countries uh, in particular technologies. And we have very uh, good cooperation on South, what we call model of South South cooperation, which is mm. China Brazil uh, joint construction of satellites. And also we have uh, the calling of the, uh, uh, the payload and instruments on board the tiny station. That is, has a very important criteria. We, one of the criteria is uh, that has never been flown on the International Space Station. So there has to be, uh, you know, uh, creativities and innovative mm. and it's in, inside these programs and, and, mm. uh, and, and application projects. So these mm. are, I think, one of the ways to encourage the developing countries to fly on board the Chinese mission. Mm. Now, Mr. Cowen, we see that China and also many countries working with China uh, is having a whole generation of new technologies that many people say reminds us of the time during the 1960s and 70s when the United States was putting tremendous effort into uh, space development uh, uh, of that phenomenon. It's not just about space itself, but also technologies related to it. Uh, and eventually contributing to the space technology. So, Mr. Cowen, how do you see a whole generation of uh, innovation as a result of space development? I, I, I want to echo what was uh, my, my guest, fellow guests had just said about, you know, bringing others in and so forth. That mm -hmm. it used to be when I was growing up in the 60s, it was Soviets and Americans. That's it. And we were competing, openly competing to do these things. And we had two different ways of doing things. And when I was working on the American Space Station program and we brought the Russians in, there was some jokes about how the different groups work together. Um, the Americans thought that the Russians can just go, you know, had to call down to do stuff, but then they just knew it in their heads. And the Russians said, oh, you have to read all these books. But somehow there was a cultural mismatch. But now with technology moving at the pace that it moves, our space station was designed in the late 90s and early 2000s. And the payloads I first worked on were the size of refrigerators. Now you have gene chips that literally are this size that can do sequencing in a matter of minutes with a laptop. We didn't know what that was. And so now you have the ability to do stuff. And what you really need is a space station and a mindset that welcomes this. This isn't just a US or Chinese or Russian capability. You have a lot of smart people in countries that are way down the economic development list who are just as capable of doing this. And I really think that some of the discoveries that will be of merit in the next uh, decade or two are going to come from people that we've never here in the West heard of. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most important thing. That's when humanity starts doing research, not just one country or another. Mr. Cowing, do you see the disruptions of global supply chains, the global innovation chains and global value chains? going to have a tremendous impact on the outer space exploration uh, when it comes to a global level? Are you worried about that? It's kind of interesting because you, you know people will say, well, what did you do before Federal Express? And the answer was, we, you didn't, you, you planned. Well, now you just assume that you have this capability. Up until just a few years ago, the rockets that we put things into space with were built by governments and governments only. Then you had companies like SpaceX and whatnot that now can launch these things. As Elon Musk said, when you don't remember what day something's launching, when it becomes boring, you know you've done it right. Well, now I don't even remember when SpaceX is going to launch again. And so we're getting to that point. We're about this far away from it. We're not just to the U.S., but in China and elsewhere, where 
you don't really think about the logistics anymore because it's either cheap or it's easy to do. You think more on what do I want to do when I get there and how do I go there more often? Mm. And so to, to answer your question, yeah, there will always be a supply chain issue. And what you want is a robust cislunar economy, you know, between here and the moon that says, oh, I need more here. And then in classic sort of economic style, somebody somewhere says, oh, I have an answer. Mm. Whereas before it was the government saying, no, you're going to do it this way or no, you're going to do it that way. So we're out right on the cusp of that right now. And it's in, mm. in a global sense, not just with one country. Mm, interesting. Uh, Mr. Xu, your thoughts on the same question? Well, I think uh, 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 Mr. Cohen was right on the uh, center of excellencies, I would call it. Uh, different countries have their own advantages. And even uh, you do not undermine smaller countries, developing countries. They have their own center of excellencies. Uh, we, we do have these uh, experiences in, in uh, the organization I work on, uh, APSCO. We, we have eight developing countries working in these organizations. And each of them have their own advantages and uh, center of excellencies. So you have to bring them their advantages together uh, to implement certain projects for the benefits mm -hmm. of the whole uh, uh, organization. And in this case, the whole supply chain for the whole, uh, whole universe or whole, whole, whole world so that we can benefit uh, differently from different countries. And mm. for example, uh, we, when Cohen mentioned about logistics, uh, we're, we're thinking about the platforms. So platform, um, the Chinese space station is one platform that you can do experiments of your own country. Uh, the rocket of China can be a platform where you, where you can launch your own satellites. So these are platforms. For example, also our uh, Earth or moon missions. Um, uh, Cohen like to mention about the size lunar uh, uh, issues and also the the more missions, uh, for example, the Chang'e four mission, which is, which was a redundancy of Chang'e three, has opened to international cooperation, which we have four European advanced instruments flying on board the mission. Also, uh, a also a Saudi Arabia camera that is flying on the on the mission as well. So taking images of of the whole uh, lunar surface. So these are cooperations that we have. We tend to provide platforms to the developing countries, fly them to give them the opportunity to fly on mm -hmm. these missions. One thing I have to mention, even though um, I don't want to make it the center of the discussion, is uh, geopolitics. Uh, it is a matter of fact. Uh, we do not want to be naive here. Uh, but uh, that poses a tremendous strategic question for everyone, I guess, for working for the outer space development. Remember, after the Cold War, the sole uh, mission of the outer space development is to help the human beings to find other options. And we together are facing so many problems, uh, you know, climate change and also natural disasters. Uh, we need the new generation of technologies that would bring better quality of life. Uh, so, uh, but now uh, with the geopolitics, are we seeing the whole logic of exploring the outer space changed? Uh, what would that mean? Uh, how do you as insiders see the very internal logic of this uh, future trend? Uh, Mr. Cowing. Right now, of course, the US and Russia are not getting along well, but we're running a space station together. And many other countries are working together on things. I, also, I often ask the question, why is it that we can do so many things in space together with the Russians and not on Earth. Maybe it's how we do it in space, that's, that's an emergent sort of an intangible benefit that we've learned how to do something up there that could have applicability on Earth. And so, uh, you know, to take this further, uh, maybe having more countries come into this uh, realm of exploration and so forth, maybe a factor that will sort of balance the bad behaviors of all of us back on Earth. Mm -hmm. And again, you just have to look at people, they're all floating around in space and they're smiling, but they're working together. And when you ask them questions about things, they, they talk as a crew. They don't, they, they're proud of their countries, but they talk as a crew of people together. And I think that's, it's hard to put into words and I'm sure somebody's translating it now. I hope they get it right, but you know, there was a phrase in America when we had some problems here, can't we all get along? I think that can and has happened in space. Mm. Mr. Xu, do you see the whole 
logic of outer space exploration changed to geopolitics, or there is still a high level of uh, confidence in international cooperation there? Well, I think there are uh, two different things. Uh, one is uh, what we call the um, um, dual-use technologies, uh, rocket technologies, uh, things being controlled by, by MTCR and ITAR uh, issues. And these are uh, constra uh, constraining the, uh, the domestic developments of different countries. Uh, China is developing its own uh, program. We have also a comprehensive industry that can do this. Uh, and also we can, uh, we can do satellites with the uh, ITAR-free uh, components. Um, but these are what we call it uh, the earthly matters, um, what we do on, on Earth. Uh, when, you, when you mentioned about explorations, uh, in particular, lunar missions, Mars missions, and scientific missions, we have less sensitive uh, uh, issues uh, involved in these uh, programs. For example, uh, the lunar mission, we have uh, exchange of data with NASA and also with the international communities. We open the data source uh, for the lunar reconnaissance uh, programs and Mars mission. And also, we, the sample returned from the lunar surface by the Chang'e 5 mission is also open for um, uh, collections and usage by uh, different international organizations. We have also policies on that. So uh, the exploration programs, uh, is particularly joint international uh, programs, uh, is less sensitive. I think it's more uh, more international cooperation uh, uh, oriented projects. But also, I would like to mention that the, there's also competition and also there there are also cooperations. Uh, competition, um, maybe we go further. But cooperation, uh, cooperation we go further. Competition we go faster. So different countries have their own uh, different programs. So this can be uh, uh, also can be seen in different angles, political angles, and also, uh, as uh, Mr. Cohen mentioned, the, the crude angles. You can also you, have, you cannot involve politics every day in your in your crew uh, activity. The other thing I want to ask is another interesting example. Um, the Earth matter that has been brought back as a result of the earlier uh, moon missions, uh, for example, now in the hands of China. Uh, now, Mr. Xu, how do you see uh, the latest researches related to that? Uh, what does that mean for, could be, for a whole new generation of discovery about the moon? I think um, we, we uh, the Chang'e 5 landing site is uh, is a relatively new uh, uh, landing uh, new areas of the lunar involvement. So we have a, a examples. So samples have been returned to the scientific community to study uh, their uh, uh, their uh, chemical, physical, isotopic uh, figures and and, and uh, data. So this can also be used uh, by the scientific community to compare with the samples returning from Apollo missions. So this can have a more comprehensive understanding of the involvement of uh, the moon and also the, the whole uh, size lunar uh, uh, activities uh, of, of the whole Earth and moon relations. So maybe that, that can also contribute to the scientific communities in the study of the moon. Mr. Cowan? You know, the, again, to the issue of um, we in space, of course, you see people floating around. I like to say we everything we do in space, we stand on the shoulders of somebody who did this before. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I, I, I can speak for a lot of people here when China landed on the far side of the moon. We're hooray. We wanted to do that, but we never got to do that during Apollo. And so you just the, the politics weren't involved in any of this. We were just like so happy that this had happened. And then uh, now that a sample return. Oh, great. More moon rocks. So this, it doesn't take much to transcend a lot of this other, you know, earthly stuff as, as was described. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, you also see the barrier being lowered. I, for example, I'll just pivot to something else. Um, one thing that they do on the International Space Station now is they launch a lot of little CubeSats, which are about this big. And you see Nepal, Ghana, and countries who don't, again, have economic issues. They have children now who go to school and say, I built and launched a spacecraft. That's pretty profound. And I think we haven't really seen the full implementation. I, I, I certainly hope China's space station is going to be doing that as well. But now we're sending some of those small satellites. Again, China, when they went to Mars, they had one that detracted, came off and took some pictures. And then another couple went to them uh, with another American spacecraft. And now we have some of these small satellites going on the moon. 
So it's not impossible for your a school just about anywhere to build an actual spacecraft that could actually be launched and actually do stuff. That's a profound thing that I think, again, we haven't seen the full implementation of that, but I, I just can't wait to see what happens when, you know, if there's 200 countries in the world, you have 200 countries with satellite de development capabilities. Uh, having said that though, we see different emphasis countries are putting on in the outer space development. Uh, China now is looking at the moon and together with the United States also looking at the Mars. Uh, but the U.S. is putting more emphasis on the Mars, even though there's missions about returning to the moon. And at the same time, developing more projects about further into the outer space, uh, beyond the, just the moon and the Mars. So how do you see these different emphasis uh, that countries uh, put on at this moment uh, for outer space exploration? Uh, Mr. Xu. I think there are uh, two different uh, types of explorations. Uh, when you mentioned about Moon and Mars, we have uh, 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 robotic missions and human missions. Uh, currently, uh, China is focusing on robotic missions to the Moon, and also we also send a number of missions to the Mars. Uh, we do, uh, you, as you know, that we we have completed the Chang'e mission from Chang'e One all the way to Chang'e Five. Uh, the next step is to to uh, to launch another. Uh, size lunar, uh, what we call a halo orbit uh, relay satellites, so that we can uh, have another mission to the far side of the moon. And also we are con beginning to construct the uh, the scientific uh, base on, on the lunar surface. This is, of course, calling for international cooperations. Mm -hmm. Along with Russia, we have organized and the announcement for this uh, mission for scientific papers. And also we are lending a number of missions to the polar region of the moon. Um, in search of uh, uh, lunar volatiles and, and water sources, uh, so these are the uh, uh, these are to pave may, pave ways for the future missions. Once there is a, a you know the parallel lines going uh, around with the human flight missions along the robotic missions, we have mm. a human mission to the surface of the, of the moon in the future. And on the Mars mission and also uh, asteroid missions, we have a number of plans in the future. Uh, for uh, Mars sample return missions. So these are robotic uh, combined with um, a human a human space flight missions. Where we see international communities like Astra uh, Artemis missions, this is to build a station around the site lunar orbit, along with the human assisted uh, uh, missions. Human will stay in the orbit and also probably future landing on the surface of the moon. Uh, of the moon. Also, a sample return mission, we, they call it human assisted sample return missions. So all of these are human oriented uh, mission, uh, the, you know, as we call it, Artemis missions. So these are different uh, approaches, but we are also going to the same goal at the same time. Keith Gowen, Xu Yan Song, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to know more, search World Insight or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for being with us. Bye for now.